How's it going there gamers? I'm Pruitt and this is Jim Davis. And on today's Web DM, we're gonna be having a conversation of a different color about Warhammer Fantasy. And what colors is that? It's mud, blood, and shit. <laughs> Let's talk about Warhammer Fantasy RPG. Oh my god, thank you. Yes, I love this game. Okay, so yeah, well, a bit of it's a lot of fun. This is a bit of personal history for me. Jim Davis, when he was a tender and impressionable 10 or 11 year old, got a copy of the Hero Quest board game from Milton Bradley, mm -hmm. which is produced in, in sort of like jointly with uh, Games Workshop, and so it technically takes place in the Warhammer world, and I played through HeroQuest. I got the Barbarian and the Elf expansion packs. It was one of the first things I ever mail-ordered uh, to come to the house. Yeah. Um, and then one of those was a little pamphlet that was just like, gotten through everything in HeroQuest? Try Advanced HeroQuest, which is like feature Skaven and a board that you put mm -hmm. together that's more like a puzzle piece, and eventually led to Warhammer Quest much yeah. later. Anyway. They upsold so, Oh God, big time. Uh, which is what Games Workshop does. And they got their hooks into me early. And so I was obsessed as a little kid with all things Warhammer. My yeah. 12th birthday, I got the new Armies of Chaos box set. It was the one that came after Lost in the Damned uh, and Realms of Chaos. I forget which version of Warhammer Fantasy Battle it was for. And it was like my parents got this one. They didn't want me playing D&D. No. My parents were like, can't play D&D. No. But they were perfectly fine getting me the, the Armies of Chaos box set. <laughs> With its demons and mutations and foul cultists. So, like, yeah, so it really is all just about optics. Uh, yes. And so, for me, Warhammer and Star Wars are my gateway DD drugs. Right. They are the RPGs that got me into playing DD. And so, I played both Warhammer and West End Star Wars for the better part of like eight or nine years before I ever touched D&D. &D. Right. And so for me, it was quick step between Hero Quest, Advanced Hero Quest, and then like, oh, this game Warhammer that had a kick-ass dwarf with like a mohawk, orange mohawk yeah. on the cover, cutting into a dwarf, and it just like, an orc. oozed. It was like an orc or a dwarf goblin, I forget. There's yeah. something, or maybe a femur. Um, <laughs> That just oozed a certain sense of style and cool, and the John Blanche art that was uh, prevalent in the first uh, first edition um, Warhammer Fantasy book, mm -hmm. which if you find somewhere, it's it, it's everything you need to play the game. It's I, not my preferred version of Warhammer uh, role playing as a rule book. It's one of those that just keeps on giving, and you can reread it and read parts of it and and check it out. It's got an intro adventure. It's got everything you need in one book, and right. I love role playing games that have everything you need in one book, not these three. Oh, D and D. <laughs> um, so, like Warhammer to me is I, that's what I cut my teeth on, and so okay. it informs so much of how I run games, how I build worlds. Let me move my wizard. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think I prefer Second Edition. Okay. Warhammer, uh, fantasy roleplay. I like it. They clean up the rules a bit in terms of the game mechanics. They are virtually identical, and I have right. run First Edition material in a Second Edition game with no prep ahead of time, just mm -hmm. straight from the book. Because we've mostly played second edition. Yeah, right. we played the full campaign of The Enemy Within, which we'll talk about here in a minute. One of the top three role-playing modules that everyone should try to play at some point in their life, either as a DM or as a player. And so it just colors everything about my experience of role-playing, Warhammer does. Okay. And, and uh, that's why it, it looms large in my... Okay, well, let's let's first my talk... Psyche. Let's first talk about the setting. Yes, okay, we'll talk about you the You are in Warhammer. the world of Warhammer. Right. Whatever the, world it is. The old Warhammer. world. The old world. Yeah. I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm sure it, maybe the world, the planet actually has a name, but it's sort of like the old world is what it's called. You know, it's like take the real world, uh, take whatever historical environments that existed in uh, Europe, anywhere from like the 1400s up to the 1600s, throw them in a mishmash blender, add in a bunch of Call of Cthulhu entities, that are the source of four or five different cults that are seeking to undermine this, rat people, weird orcs, and then a continent, you know, everything that would be in North America is just all lizard men and dark elves, and the whole thing is held together by these two <laughs> polar gates that bleed magic into the world, and occasionally that magic overwhelms everyone, and that's when chaos sort of invades. There's a lot going on in the Warhammer mm -hmm. setting. What I like about it is that Warhammer, in that first edition rule book, it seemed very grounded, yeah. It seemed very down to earth uh, in terms of the, the types of adventures that you would go on, but it also seemed utterly fantastic. 
Right. And so the, the, the blending of those two and with the elements of, the, of fantasy almost always being horrific and, <laughs> and terrifying. Well, that, is, that is the one thing I always came away with uh, in Warhammer was yeah. you kind of have to be careful with your fights because you could come away from a battle Changed. Changed, yeah. Before we continue on this line of thought, I, I think it's worthwhile to mention that it recently, within the last couple of years, uh, I, I, Warhammer as a setting underwent a dramatic change. They, they did something with the rules to their fantasy battles game. I never really was into fantasy battle. I was almost always into Warhammer role-playing. Right. So I can't really speak to what changes have gone on with the Age of Sigmar and the fact that they seem to all be riding dinosaurs and they're all angels and it looks more like 40K than it does Warhammer. I have no idea. I know that the miniatures look cool, but I have I don't really know anything about the setting. So back to back to it. Yes, the the setting is grim and and and, and dark, dark and bleak, <laughs> and you could enter into a fight as a competent warrior, well armed and equipped, and can still leave that fight missing a limb, or or having been knocked upside the head so severely that it changes you. Yeah. And so violence in Warhammer. First off, I, I think the combat system, the way it's laid out, it's still smooth and second edition made it even smoother and made it a lot the the action economy resembles dungeons and dragons in a in a strong way yeah in it terms really of does what you can do and what you can't do um but the way that say damage works you have a low number of hit points probably topping out somewhere in the mid teens yeah once those are gone you start rolling on the injury table which depending on what type of weapon is used uh, and where you were hit mm -hmm. uh, determines the type of injury we used a wound table that we posted uh, in the Oozes episode that and was we'll, written, and, and we'll repost it, we'll don't repost it was written by uh, apparently a trauma surgeon who thought that the rules for, for death and injury mm -hmm. uh, in the in the Warhammer Second Edition weren't up to snuff, so he rewrote them. Yeah, uh, as well as a long description of how healing works and and how it works on the body, and that was what I used for pretty much the entirety of the Enemy Within campaign, and there were some pretty spectacular deaths. Some yeah. pretty spectacular injuries. Um, yeah, I'm, and I'm immediately me, immediately go to Josh's character who got caught by whatever that thing there was, a, was. There was a chaos warrior that had a living sword that was basically like a, a sawtooth blade. Yeah, and he was his foot was injured and mangled, and so he had to take it off. Right, he had because he was a barber surgeon. He was a barber surgeon, and he had to cut his own foot off because he couldn't save it. Correct, yeah. and uh, and it prompted him to become a witch hunter after yeah. that. So he he got a, had a wooden foot and was a witch hunter. Yeah. No, 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 no. no. It was metal because remember it, was it, would, it would it would clang everywhere, everywhere he'd walk. He could, then became kind of like Saul Guerrero or whatever yeah, yeah. from uh, uh, Star Wars. <laughs> Just come, come. Like you know. Cane that he walked with. Yeah, the cane and everything. Um, but that's the thing about Warhammer and the setting is when you're dealing with chaos, either physically or mentally. Right. You could walk away with scars. You could walk away with scars. You're either going to go insane uh, because of something you saw or something that mm -hmm. happened to you, or you're going to fight them yeah. and come away. And so, like, there's a there's sort of a, uh, a sort of a trope to to Warhammer in the setting that there's only three colors. Yeah. In Warhammer, and those are uh, mud, blood, and shit, and that tells you everything you need to know about mm -hmm. Warhammer. It is not high powered, and that's the difference between fantasy battles. Warhammer Fantasy Battles and Warhammer Roleplay. Warhammer Fantasy Battle, everybody's riding griffins and the dragons swoop mm -hmm. in and there's these large sweeping armies that do battle on the field and it's like high fantasy. And then you come over here to Warhammer Roleplay and it's like, well, I, what'd you roll up? Well, I rolled up a cook who's got average everything yeah. and doesn't even have a proper weapon. And so what am I supposed to do on my first adventure? And so it takes them a few adventures to get going and mm -hmm. then they use the follow a career path that sort of organically grows their character in a way that they want to and then two or three careers later they are who they are right. they are the adventurer but they right. don't start out as heroes they don't start out as adventurers they start out as regular people with day jobs yeah get swept up in these events you start out as a, as a, as a barber surgeon or as a rat catcher yeah. or a town a guard bailiff a town guard a fisherman um, uh, depending on what career uh, tables you're using a slave yeah, <laughs> if you're, you're like you're escaped from the slate uh, from the Skaven mines. That's why I I like it. And I prefer role playing over it because of its sort of uh, 
grimness and its bleakness. It's it, it borderline depressing, but first edition Warhammer had so many puns and inside jokes and sort of goofiness to it mm -hmm. that it blunts that dark edge. Well, right. I mean, and probably probably one of the most integral parts of Warhammer, and I don't know if it still holds from 40k to RPG. Okay. But the orcish cockney accent. Do you still <laughs> hold with the orcs having oi? I'm gonna come over there and kill you. Spice Marines. Yeah, spice Marines. Uh, I kind of do. I mean, it's fun. That's that's right? what's fun about. I mean, orcs and Warhammer, whether it's 40k or fantasy battles, is like they're soccer hooligans. And yeah. So the, to me, they have that kind of uh, Cockney accent. Um, they bleed green blood. Apologize uh, to all of our viewers in the UK. Yeah, uh, yes, that's part of the appeal of it. They're also hulking brutes, giants, goblin squig riders, and night runners, and all the other kinds of things that make Warhammer Warhammer. I mean, it, it, there's so much about, particularly the orcs and goblins, that's just downright goofy. Mm -hmm. That you can play it uh, silly, or you can play it straight, and watch the players just go, did that goblin really launch himself out of a catapult with a spike on its head and try to kill you? You know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It has a crude parachute behind it that it's trying to steer, <laughs> but you know, it, it, it these are living missiles they're shooting at you. Um, it, you know, it, I think that Warhammer both. 40K, which we'll do another show on at some point, and, and Fantasy, they are at their best when they don't take themselves too seriously. Right, of and course. It, Have a sense of humor about your, your broodingness. Looking right. at you, Warner Brothers movies. Right. Um, and your superhero DC <laughs> efforts. Superheroes. <laughs> um, and so I think with, uh, with Warhammer, the difference between first and second edition, first is maybe a bit sillier, in more inside jokes. Second edition takes itself a bit more seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the tone of it just didn't wasn't quite 100% what people liked about first edition. But you know, it's, they're basically the same game. Right. Um, and so I had an opportunity a few years ago. We were I forget where exactly we were playing, but I was like, you know, hey, I'd finally found all of the modules in the Enemy Within campaign, and it mm -hmm. had taken me something like 13 years to collect them all. Just as I'd see them in used bookstores, or I'm sure, if I was really wanted it, I would have gotten it earlier, Jim. Good grief. Yeah, uh, thirteen years. It's called the internet. Jeez, it's called eBay. Yeah, you can um, literally have that over a weekend. But, but I, you know, I like to just kind of like let these things percolate for decades on end. And so I was like, all okay, right, we got to run this, and I had an opportunity to run it. And it's a different kind of campaign. You'd probably uh, describe it now as more like an adventure path, yeah. where it is designed to be. To, this adventure is used for the entirety. You're going to play this whole thing out. We did, for the most part, started with, um, you know, the Mistaken Identity adventure. There weren't many human uh, males in the party, actually, so the one of them that was there sort of gets mistaken for this cultist, and it's like you go tracking down this false inheritance, then the cult keeps trying to mm -hmm. to get in touch with you, sort of hilarious results. Yeah. As yeah. they sort of make weird gestures at you, and you're like, I don't even know who you are. And yeah, because, oh, yeah, because was it my character they kept character thinking they kept was thinking the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then you get caught up in sort of these events in, in this sort of uh, sleepy uh, sheep farming community, Bogenhofen, uh, and it just sort of spirals out of control. And at each stage, the players find themselves sort of surrounded by these horrific events. They're either investigating them or they sort of happen upon the characters. At one point, you guys got a river boat and did some river trading up and down the, the different mm -hmm. rivers in there. All the while, this religious civil war is building up in the background. These two factions... Uh, one religion and another offshoot, religions of uh, Uruk and uh, Sigmar, are at each other's throats and sort of the use of, through the use of doppelgangers and the fact that the emperor is old and feeble and just like all these events eventually lead up into a full-blown religious civil war, uh, which is kind of where we ended the campaign um, which also one of the few mass battles that I've run in an RPG where you guys play different characters in one of these uh, one of these battles. It was just a really rewarding experience. Probably one of my favorite campaigns that I've run. Uh, Audie's Wizard taking off a guy's head with a lightning bolt mm -hmm. uh, is another one that I can think of. The the uh, the duel between uh, the half Emma's halfling um, judicial champion yeah. and the other judicial champion that went on forever, forever. <laughs> and it was just like the two of them could couldn't hurt each other, but the way that the combat played out, it wasn't just I swing, you miss. It's like they're dodging, parrying, trying to trip, mm -hmm. doing this. And so it was much more 
uh, interactive than, say, a duel might be in, in Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, obviously, the one thing I really remember is that, like, all of my best characters is their death. Right. Because that was the one, like, at the end, like, right at the end when we were in the wizard's tower. <laughs> and yes. he's just about to cast, like, some crazy spell with his, with his wand or his staff. Uh -huh. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to run up there and I, like, crit it or whatever. Uh -huh. Except he tried to use his staff to block it, so I cut it in half, releasing uh, all the chaos out of it. Into you. Into me yeah. and, and him, and I immediately start going Akira. Yeah, you just like start like flesh mutating, tumors uh -huh. shooting out of my arms, and you're like, yeah, well, you have one action, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what's this? What does this look like? like well, he's up. You're up on a on a on a on like a, a like a landing right next to a big mosaic window. Uh -huh, and I'm uh -huh. like, all right, I grab him and jump out the window. Yeah. Because it was like, can I get back to them? Can they even cast anything to save me? <laughs> no, no. No. Like no. Okay. Well, yeah. I grab like, him and jump out the window. A Twenty foot tumor growing out of your arm. Yeah. At the rate of a foot per round. <laughs> foot per round. Just clunk, 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 clunk. Uh, yeah. But yeah, and so, you know, and then we plunge down and we take the wizard out as I splatter yes, on the that ground. Very, that was a very memorable one. Hey, you know, um, you got to do what you got to do, right? Magic is, magic is one of my favorite, you do have to do what you have to do. <laughs> uh, magic is one of my favorite things about Warhammer because magic is dangerous. And yes. so mag all magic involves a skill roll. Yeah. Uh, you, there's no automatic casting like there is in Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And so there's a chance if you roll, say, doubles or, um, you know, a certain number that comes up. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you roll on a mishap table. Yeah, it's very, uh, very like a wild sorcerer in that regard. But everybody, that regard, has but everybody has to deal with it. Everything, everybody has to deal with it, and every and, and different spellcasters roll on different mishap tables depending on what kind of magic they're using. Whether mm -hmm. it's just like the color of magic or chaos magic or uh, priestly magic. In this case, this was a sorceress of Slanesh. She was casting a spell at you. It was already going to mutate you or something but the mishap was just like, it gets it worse. <laughs> yeah, whatever was gonna happen, otherwise it just gets worse. The magic system, because magic is dangerous and had such an influence on the setting, there's a lot of interesting things that the rules do with magic. So you, there's sort of a baseline, everybody knows these spells, they're sort of universal magic. And it's things like, you know, I can read a magic or shoot just like a, a very minor magic missile or something like that, sort of low level utility magic. And then you pick one of, I believe, eight different colors of magic, jade, amber, bright, light, uh, uh, celestial, I'm not going to remember them all. Um, and that, mm. those correspond to one of the winds of magic that blow down from the poles and influence it. It's as if you took the spell schools of D&D &D and it was just like you can only cast those spells. You can't, yeah. you can't cast anything else. Evokers are stuck with evocation magic. Mm -hmm. But the type of magic that you choose to specialize in starts to influence your personality yeah. and your physical characteristics, yeah. right? So bright mages in Warhammer, uh, it's not just that they wield fire magic, it's that it starts to influence their personality and their hair changes color. Yeah. And they and they look disheveled and sort of the the things that they need to do, the fact that they always have to have a little fire with them everywhere means that they're always kind of carrying like stabs that are on fire or torches and things. Jade magic, you know, becoming more in tune with uh, the earth. Amethyst magic, they're more in tune with the dead. And yeah, so I, I did. Uh, was it yellow? Is it metal? Yeah, there would have been yellow. I believe it was. Uh, was it? I forget the exact. It's probably like gold, maybe. Yeah, gold I think magic. it was gold. But yeah, it was like, so it was like it was a lot of metal. Metal, and so eventually, like one thing I, I loved about them is like. You got high enough. Eventually, you're just like a metal statue, and you have to like have people like dolly you around because right. you physically can't move because you've turned to you've metal. Turned to metal, yeah. But it also so gave you a bunch of benefits. It gives you a ton of benefits, and so I, you know, magic in that respect uh, is is it influences the magic user, right? Uh, just as much as the spells do. And so there have been times when I've toyed with importing some of those ideas into D and D. And so like if I was going to try to replicate that experience, then every the same way that you have to make like a caster check to dispel magic against you know like I'm I'm casting a third level magic against a fifth level spell. Dispel magic against the fifth level spell. You got to make that roll. You might make that like every non cantrip. You got to roll. Yeah. You've got to beat it. Uh, you know the DC is you know, ten plus spell level or not eight plus spell level, whatever it is. Uh, and if you don't, something bad happens. Maybe you just roll on the wild mage sorcerer or the wild sorcerer table. Um, you know, or, or you come up with your own. Um, maybe you have it that the type of magic that you specialize in influences your personality traits. And diviners are have a certain personality mm -hmm. that, that regardless of what they individually want the magic works uh, its influence on them right um, 
So that's how, that's might, might be how I do it. To, uh, yeah, they might come become more like aloof and objective about everything. Right, about just about everything, and and yeah, they want to see it from all sides and never make a decision. They never make a decision. Like, yeah, uh, and it's just like it's difficult to like. What do you want on your sandwich, diviner? It's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, I see that the crop from the I south. See, I could have had the crop from the <laughs> chickens. Yeah. And so magic is a big thing about Warhammer that I love. Uh, some other things are Skaven. Uh, the rat men that yeah. sort of maintain this giant under empire. Do they exist? Do they not exist? They're a, a neat monster to bring in. Uh, sort of like they fill in the same shoes as were rats, except they are global. Right. Um, they have, you know, they have nests under every city. And then, of course, there's chaos. They're the four chaos gods, and how they're the four main ones, and how they interact with humanity, what their <clears throat> followers are like, the kind of weird things they get up to. Um, it, it's effect on people just being near it. Just being near it, and so there's this sort of Lovecraftian, uh, you know, that these these entities are. You know, it, I, I've always been like, are they truly evil, or do they just represent such extremes of uh, bad behavior that it, they just appear evil? You know, uh, I like the idea that the chaos powers are necessary to humanity, like that that you know that spilling blood for the blood god is you know. People are going to die, and the blood god exists. Corn exists because uh, people kill each other. They kill each other in cold blood. They kill each other on the battlefield, and mm -hmm. you know that's a manifestation of that part of humanity. So, well, I mean, that's that's a whole philosophical debate about gods creating men or men creating gods, and the uh, yeah. the connection in between, and like, the connection in between. And so, I, I think that that's why I like uh, Warhammer because it's one of those things where. Yes, the gods exist, and the only one, you know, they're, they're more good aligned gods, uh, or at least more gods that are less hostile to civilization, we'll yeah. say. But the really epic evil gods, the ones that are there to, if they win, life on earth as you know it, life in the old world is over, are the ones that are born out of humanity. And, yeah. and humanity's flaws and foibles and things like that. So I love Warhammer. If you've, if you've never played it, never had a chance, pick up a book at a used bookstore somewhere, go online. There's tons of resources and setting information. It's one of those settings where anything you want to know about it's in a fan wiki somewhere. Or, yeah, yeah. You, know, you can use it that way. So just uh, walk me through just a little bit of the system itself. Just, just, a, just a taste. Right. Uh, so you basically have the option of making a completely random character. Yeah. Um, all of your characteristics uh, are going to be randomly determined based on your race. Uh, they separate out your physical characteristics and your ability to fight. So you can have a high weapon skill or a high ballistic skill, not necessarily have a high strength or agility. Right. So you have these characteristics, everything from weapon skill, ballistic skill, on through wounds and perception and your ability willpower. to get along, or, willpower. Yeah. Um, depending on what edition it is, like there's more more characteristics in first edition than there is in second. And then you roll for a career based on uh, what race you chose. And these careers offer you a variety of skills and advancements that you buy with XP, and then they have uh, a certain career exits. So once you've bought all the advancements of a certain career, you then say, well, okay, now I, I have some options here. Mm -hmm. I can have one of three ways that I can grow the character, I can exit out. Yeah. Uh, and ideally, this is tied into role-playing, sort of this character's exiting of one career, finding a trainer or a mentor that will bring them into the other career. Mm -hmm. And so you measure your character in terms of how many careers that they've progressed along. And I think we got to four careers. Like Some of y'all who had stuck with it uh, were able to get like the fourth career on their uh, yeah. on their progression, and they and had odd one, like say for instance the halfling started as a bailiff, and became yes. and then somehow became a thug or a something like like became criminal, mm -hmm. and then eventually sort of worked their way back out of that into judicial champion. Judicial champion, yeah. and so it, it just it's an organic way of growing the character. Um, that I really like. That's just kind of it in a nutshell. It's really random. You can not know at all what you're gonna start with. I like that because I can sit down to play Warhammer and I can go, all right, let me give me some dice. Roll up my character and mm -hmm. out of that create character creation experience, I now have my character. I know how many brothers and sisters they have, what his father did, what his, what his mother did, yeah. uh, where they're from, all of that stuff. And it creates a character for you and then it's like, oh, now you get to, now you get to play it. Right, right. And it's just a percentile, right? Yeah, D10. Percentile, yeah. You're just rolling under a percentile. I got a 35% chance to hit with my ballistics. So you got to get yeah. that or under. I believe it's if you roll uh, doubles, 
for like a 33, a 22, an 11. Uh, it's like a crit or something. You know, Ulrich's Fury. Just yeah, Ulrich's Fury, that's called. what it was. Of course, and then if you also... You uh, do that well with magic, though. You can do that with magic, and then you get a mishap. If you, uh, it, there's exploding dice for damage, so if you roll a 10, ten. if you keep rolling 10s, then you keep rolling 10s. And, so, and, I li- and I've always liked that. I mean, of course, it can happen to you, too. Yeah. Uh, but because it, 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 somebody can just get a perfect arrow shot and drop some, drop even whoever with one well, there, arrow. There was one fight that we had. You were storming a castle. It was the same castle that your first character ended up carrying out and showing off. Yeah. So before that happens, you're sort yeah. of storming with a group of hunters and woodsmen who had been who had fled this village where the the rulers of the castle were taking villagers and experimenting on them and taking right. their body parts to build these flesh golems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, they were mani- and then they were manipulating tho- those and sort of mutating them. And so these villagers kind of lived in fear. They either had mutations themselves or their body parts were being harvested. And so like some of those villagers and hunters joined you and about 20 of them maybe assaulted this castle with you. Mm-hmm. And there's this really cool running battle where there's like found, you know, <laughs> Get, get up in the uh, get up in the castle wall through the secret entrance. Get all, Everybody get all, way all the way up, up in, in there. there, and then they you spread out on the walls. And there's this like archery battle mm-hmm. between an inner keep that's in that's in sort of the inner courtyard, and everybody that's uh, gotten in there. And then like some of you are breaking down the door to that to get to the guys that are inside. And it was just fast and loose, and even though there's people like dying with, and you can know exactly this guy was hit in the head with an arrow. What happens to him? Well, that arrow goes straight through the back of his head and he topples over. Some mm-hmm. of them live. And so you can, it allows you to describe your, the actions in a combat in a much more detailed way because you're rolling hit location and injury. Yeah. The play, it has a much more concrete feel well, to combat than D&D combat does. It, Even though you can just describe it in D&D, there's something about having rule support for it. That well, it's, it's, the ra- it's the random nature. Uh, the randomness of, uh, of combat in that, and when you roll, you know, you roll 54 to hit, and then you flip that 45, well, 45, if I remember correctly, is body. Right. And so you hit him in the body, right? Yeah. And, and, but it, it, I always thought it was very, very concise. It's very quick. To, it's like, oh, it's this, it's that, I hit him there. Okay, well, that actually went over. That's a, I'm, I'm going to need you to roll on the crit table. Yeah. And, you know, and then it's, yeah, you disembowel and they watch their intestines. They will bleed out in two rounds. So for players of D&D who want to try something different, maybe they want to try something with a bit more involved combat or they want to try something that uh, features a world that's maybe a bit more dangerous, mm-hmm. they can try uh, Warhammer. It's difficult to find. Third edition was made by a completely different company and has a completely different rule set, and I did not like what I saw and stayed well away from it. Um, but there are my second edition. <laughs> but there are retro clones of Warhammer. Uh, Zweihander is uh, one of them. It's a fan-made effort, um, but it's a retro clone of Warhammer, aiming to try to get as much of that experience uh, of playing the game as possible with a product that's available currently. Um, so I'm I'm excited to try out Zweihander. I'd like to one day, but I you know just know it's it's an option if you'd like to try out those rules. Yeah. But yeah, I love Warhammer, and uh, you know, the memes for Warhammer are great, but like, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is a lot different than Fantasy Battles. Yeah. Blood, blood, and shit. Um, I'm, I just want a sandwich, I don't need anything else. I had, a, I had, maybe our viewers would like to see the Texas-sized... I'm always, I'm always scandalized by Waterburger's cups. <laughs> I just every time I see them, it's just like, geez. What a large. A large. The fact that their medium used to be their large, and then they were like, you know what? Fuck that. Yeah. This is Texas. This is Texas. And then they I think go. The to- only ones that are bigger, I think, are Sonics. Uh, maybe I don't know. Uh, well, no, no, but that's a forty-four. Is this? Yeah, that's forty-four ounce, man. Jeez. All right. Do well, you want to fill your bladder twice over? Come on want, down to Waterburger. Do you want to give your insulin production the run for its money? 